during different stages of development. Dr. Salas is the advisor for White Coats for Black Lives and supports students in addressing medical mistrust in the Harlem community, especially around COVID-19 vaccination. Dr. Salas has over a dozen publications and grants addressing health disparities and issues around equity. Originally from Puerto Rico, Dr. Salas has lived in New York City for 13 years, where she's raising her two sons while fighting for educational equity from pre-K to higher education with the hopes of living in an anti-racist community. She is currently president of CEC4 and is on the steering and advisory committees of Parents for Responsive Equitable Safe Schools, or Press NYC, of, of New York City Opt Out, of Black Lives Matter at Schools NYC and New Yorkers for Racially Just Public Schools. She served on the Socio-Emotional Learning and Girls Color Task Force. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Dr. Salas has received several awards for fighting for equity in schools, including this year's Alliance for Quality Education Grassroots Leadership Award. And our, finer sp and our final speaker will be Liz Rosenberg. Liz is a longtime educator, coach, and equity advocate. She's worked primarily in New York City public schools and city agencies, where she's done community engagement using human-centered design. Most recently, Liz co-founded Parents for Responsive Equitable Safe Schools, Press NYC, in response to New York's pandemic, New York City's pandemic school policies, and launched the People's Dashboard that she'll be discussing today. In this role, she's focused on providing the public and especially the media with essential data needed to assess risk and push for public health policies that center Black, Latinx, immigrant, and indigenous families, students with disabilities, and students in temporary housing. Um, and now I will ask you to please welcome our first speaker, Senior Advisor at Partners in Health, Shefali Oza. Hey everyone, I'm going to, I'm gonna try my screen share. Um, okay, I think that worked. And Laura, I'm supposed to move myself somehow, right? Like here? Is that good? Perfect. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm excited to talk to you all. Um, I, as Laura said, I've been working on the COVID uh, pandemic since 2020, April 2020, uh, on the Massachusetts effort. It's my first time actually working in the US. I usually work on global health. Um, I'm an epidemiologist by training, but I've I've worked on health systems and um, information systems in particular in other settings. So I both want to talk a little bit about the work I've been doing for the last 18 or so months, but also reflecting on that and other information systems I've worked on, kind of pulling together some thoughts on on how we even get to the essential data that we want to see. Um, so in about the next 10 to 12 minutes, I'll, I'll try to go quickly. Um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about what it looked like to set up an emergency health, public health program. Um, I, I've been working with the Massachusetts Contact Tracing Collaborative, which is a statewide contact tracing program that Massachusetts started in April of 2020 to support local health departments um, to be kind of a pop-off valve for when uh, cases overwhelmed local health departments. So what, what it meant to set up a program like that, um, including the kind of all the data decisions that go into something like that, and then some pretty quick reflections on data design use and systems more broadly, and then uh, one data-related wish, though I kind of cheated and <laughs> there several wishes in there. Uh, so looking at the Massachusetts Community Tracing Collaborative through a data lens, um, I would say that there are several components where we tried to weave data and, and what it means to collect and use good data. Um, so the first was just in the data system design and how it integrates with other systems. Because a lot of the challenges that I think we're seeing across the board in the US and elsewhere on the kind of essential data that we would like to see often occurs because of this one or problems with this one, which is uh, what, how data systems are designed, how, whether they can even speak to other systems, how standardized the information is across different systems um, and whether data can, can move between systems so that it can be analyzed and aggregated, et cetera. 
So we, uh, in this uh, initiative, we had to design a contact tracing platform and then have it integrate. We worked with the Department of Public Health to integrate it with the surveillance system in the state. Uh, so just, um, I won't go into too many details because it's it's a short panel, but just a, a lot of work went into how to design that. Um, there are a lot of lessons learned about this. I just put in a few graphics to not, um, they're not comprehensive in any way, but kind of just th the types of things that if you don't think through initially can really bite you and you might be stuck with uh, afterwards and can have huge repercussions for what data the public are even able to see, not because people are trying to not share data, but it might just not be available because of how systems were set up. Uh, so that was a core part of some of what we did. Another thing we did pretty early on was think through all the different metrics, the types of metrics we wanted to collect for the different audiences. Like there's, you know, they're the, um, there's kind of the general population. They're the people who run the program. Uh, they're the people who um, in government who are making decisions on policy and all that. So um, pretty early on, this is, this is just an example of a, of a spreadsheet we put together like a few days after I joined the program um, to say, what are the different categories of metrics that we want to be able to capture? And how do we design the program to be able to capture these? And who are the different audiences that these are relevant for? Um, and things that sound mundane, like the exact definition needed, because as silly as it may sound, getting that denominator wrong can completely throw off your estimate or make it not at all interpretable with other states' data, for example. Um, Data-related trainings, we tried to weave data into all the system components um, and spent a lot of time actually on training. We had uh, upwards of 2,000 contact tracers at some points. And so how do you train everyone to collect good data? Because the information they're doing is they're collecting a ton of data um, and a lot of it's essential for what you want to get out. But there's little use in reporting data if it's all scrambled and there's, there's just very low quality. And so we put together a lot of different uh, data trainings on how to collect data, why we collect data, the kind of motivation behind all that, because um, we found in this and other work I've done that if if the motivation isn't um, clear, then it becomes really hard to collect uh, high quality data. And then for data quality, we um, built a system that could help us over time monitor data quality um, and then kind of improve data quality by going back through all of these other things, making it pretty iterative. So also early on <laughs> during a middle of the night kind of jam session with my computer, I thought I should bring out rainbow colors, but you can see that we were trying really hard to put together a system um, that we had steps like practical steps on how to get to high quality data and what to do when we don't have good data quality. And then we tried a lot to inform our operations. So not just to collect the data, but then to use the data to inform our operations. This is just an, ex an example of, of how we tried to think through like during a surge, how do we prioritize who to call? We didn't want to do it randomly. We wanted to both use our data and our knowledge of epidemiology to say, let's prioritize um, cases and, and contacts based on things that make sense. Sorry, I'm going pretty slowly. So. All this to say that um, the last part on this is that it, it was all quite iterative. And so each of these kind of fed into the other ones. And we kept iterating both on the data system and the um, the program based on the information we were getting out of the, uh, the data. And we had a pretty solid data team. And the reason I mention all of this also is because, um, you know, it's it's hard to do something like this, and we had all sorts of hiccups during an emergency. Um, but I've also found through other work I've done that if you don't do this during the emergency, especially in the early phases when you're building the pieces, then because of the chaos of doing an emergency response, it it ends up not happening at all. Um, and so we, we were trying to show that we could build a program that was data-centric, um, so anyway, based on that and some other stuff, I'll try to zip through these reflections. So first is that uh, 
and, and the reflections were based on talking to Laura about, you know, what are essential data? And, and instead of going into what are essential data for the pandemic, what I tried to go into is how do you get that essential data out? Because there's a lot behind the scenes that can enable or prevent essential data from reaching the people that need to see it. Um, so data, not just data, when you're putting together a data system, really understanding the authority on who creates the data, who controls it, who authorizes whether and how it can be used, whether and how it can be shared. And in large public health or other programs, often these things are uh, spread across different agencies and whether it's the government, nonprofits, the software company building. And so getting those things figured out early on is, is really important because otherwise, sometimes this itself can be a deal breaker to um, getting the information that you need, or or it could easily enable that kind of information sharing. Um, there are a lot of times when people think of things as data decisions, like whether you share or not, but there are a lot of policies and uh, how operations are done that can have really big impacts on data flow and collection, which aren't actually data decisions. So for example, or vice versa. For example, if it's decided that for COVID, a lab test needs to go to a surveillance system that then goes to a contact tracing program, that's a that's a non-data decision that impacts the flow, which means that cases, instead of going immediately to contact tracing, may have a one or two day delay as they flow through these other systems. So that's that's a that's a policy decision or some other kind of decision that has a big impact on data flow. Um, and so data decisions sometimes get made for other reasons, but have big impacts, including on eventually the metrics you look at. Uh, good data um, also require a lot of solid support systems, um, training, monitoring, how operations work for collection of that data, uh, access to the data. And then also that data uh, coordination, I think, is one of the most important things you need in a pandemic response across different, for when talking about public health interventions, and data can either really help facilitate coordination or it can really hurt it. So, for example, if your data systems can't talk to each other, then it's hard to get information between uh, lab tests and vaccines and contact tracing systems. These are all things that can really hamper uh, not just what data is available, including data that you really want, um, but also how well these kind of programs can coordinate with each other. Um, I'm going to try to speed up. Laura, please cut me off whenever, whenever it's time. Um, data, You're, You're absolutely fine. I, I strongly believe that data should not only go upwards. I don't really know the term to use for this, but there are a lot of data systems. I would say the majority of data systems where data is entered and then it disappears, it's gone. You never see it again, or it's the majority of it isn't used. Little bits might be pulled out to um, deliver some metric to someone, but that also means a lot of information that could be used to improve the program, to inform the pandemic, uh, pandemic in this case, uh, all sorts of other things kind of can get lost. And thinking about that up front, I think, is really important. Um, so I really think that data systems, and there are data systems out there right now that were put together for the pandemic that don't allow the people who collect the data, even like management, to be able to use that data for things like monitoring and analysis. And that's not, it's not intentional, but because it wasn't intentionally designed to allow that, it makes it really hard. And then you can't, it, on your programs, which in cases like pandemics were put together so quickly, so chaotically that they usually need nonstop kind of iteration until you can get like a stable system that's delivering what you want. So I think being able to make sure that the data is available, you know, this is the step even before like having the plan, like making sure that your system lets you do that. And the other one is that the data is shareable. So shareable in all sorts of ways, right? And that goes back to that partly to that question of um, who makes the decisions about sharing. But this is also sharing, like, is your data system able to share data? And they're not all able to share. Like, if you have data that you need to share across jurisdictions because, you know, viruses don't respect town borders, is your data system able to do that? Uh, can it get past some of the jurisdictional blocks? 
And what if you need to put some of those blocks in because of policy restrictions, um, but you still need to make the data shareable, the raw data and the kind of metrics. So these are all, I think, really important questions to consider both when designing systems, but also these are all useful, I think, as we think about how to push for essential data to be available. Um, data uses are not static. So I think we all, you know, I think everyone would acknowledge that um, one should use data to be informed. So what's happening with the pandemic? What's happening in your town? What are vaccination rates like? How are we doing on testing? And then also to use data to inform. So say, you know, we're finding that vaccination rates are low in these communities, or here's data for a cluster investigation that was done um, so that we can respond, do an outbreak response. There are all sorts of ways this is done, but I think we can probably all find a lot of examples of how dashboards are often created and then that's it, you know, like they don't, there are a lot of dashboards that haven't been modified since May or June of 2020. And so a question I think for us to always ask and work on is how, how do we, which data and how are data used and visualized across all these different categories, especially over time for something as fast changing as a pandemic, but for different audiences, different purposes. Uh, I'll go a bit faster. Sorry, I keep saying that. Data, uh, not as an afterthought. I think it usually is an afterthought when you're putting together programs very quickly. So plan early and continuously. Weave data through system components. I, I touched on that before. And I think often data becomes a reactive thing. Uh, programs are set up and then the public demands some information. And so then authorities quickly scramble to try to get that information. It might not necessarily be the most useful information to share, or it might not be shareable because it wasn't proactively designed. And so thinking very early on, even if it's imperfect on what metrics you want, what are they satisfying? Are they public health metrics? Are they program improvement metrics? Whatever it is. And then one that I feel very strongly about is also that I think data systems should be treated as infrastructure right now. I couldn't think of the analog, like maybe an Olympic village or something like something that's more disposable. Tr data systems are not currently treated as infrastructure. There is a ton, hundreds of millions of dollars going into data systems that are then retired, not just for COVID, but for other things. They're kind of thrown out because they weren't perfect. They don't, you know, they're not needed in that way anymore. But I think that's an enormous loss and it leads to a lot of bad systems. So they're not disposable, just like infrastructure, you spend a lot of time pre-planning and doing requirements gathering for a bridge. Uh, you try to make your um, systems, even if they're complex like this system, try to make them easy to use, build uh, the core and then extend. Don't build a giant monster of a system. It makes it really hard and they need maintenance. My one data related wish, which I'll just blast through, is that uh, I think a huge gap in the pandemic is that we found that there aren't co coherent public health data systems that satisfy both surveillance, which is a big thing that states and national systems do, and case management, which is what local health needs have. And then I think you need affordable, easy to use, flexible systems. And I think those are not um, quite there either. And you need systems to be able to talk to each other and you need to be able to access them. It, it sounds hard. It's not that hard, but you do need buy-in and funding. And that's, I'm sorry, that was quite long, but that's, that's it for me. Thank you, Shafali. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Dr. Salas. And, and uh, Dr. Salas, if you'd like to drag yourself over to the, to the left so that we can see you a little larger or to the top screen or I'm happy to help with that. And of course I need to unmute myself. Um, the question, the, the action of all actions, unmute yourself. Um, hi everybody, that was amazing. Thank you, Dr. Shafali. Um, so we're, Liz and I are gonna um, talk to you a little bit about our organization, how it came about, but also, um, what we believe um, should be the way that uh, our cities, our states um, provide information for us uh, so that we can make informed decisions about our children's lives. One of the things that we were experiencing in New York City was that all of a sudden different options um, 
and information to make those decisions were not afforded to us. Um, and so we came together last summer um, as an organization. Uh, we're all women. A lot of us are women of color. Um, but we came together and really thought about a comprehensive plan um, that, that proposed a delayed face in approach in terms of how we would reopen schools in New York City um, in fall of 2020. Um, and a lot of it focused on really centering the most marginalized students uh, that are part of our educational system. In New York City, 80% of our students are students of color. Um, we have 40% of the students that are students that um, have IEPs. We have a large number of immigrant students that are English language learners. And we wanted to ensure a quality education for all of those children especially because during this time, COVID has impacted those communities the most significantly. So if you can um, give me the next screen, um, here is our website. Um, and so we came up with the name Press Parents for Responsive Equitable Safe Schools because, because we really wanted to center um, those values in how we approach the work and make it sustainable work, right? So although we came together around COVID, um, we really wanted to move the work forward of all sorts of policies that impact marginalized students. And you can go ahead to the next slide. And so the thing about us is that we have, we're not only moms, <laughs> but we, we also, a large portion of our group has served or is currently serving on our local school boards. So we have access to what the Department of Education is proposing. We don't have a lot of power or input but we have access to the information. And so we try to navigate those spaces in order so that we can advocate appropriately. Um, we're from all across the city. So it's not just focused on one borough versus another. We cover all five boroughs. And one of the things that we find important in terms of making decisions on how, and, and looking at the data um, and analyzing the data and, and making evidence-driven practices um, one of the things that we, we always want to bring up front is that New York City has a very unique system where there are lots of different variables that can impact the health and safety of the folks that are in those school buildings. Um, we have teachers that, are, that live out of state. We have students that are taking public transportation. We have large communities we have, uh, that are predominantly Black, Latinx, immigrant families that don't have access to health care. Um, and so, and we also live in the most segregated educational system in the whole country. And so all of those things really impact all of the different variables that can impact health access, health equity, social determinants of health, um, which make it all that more important in understanding what exactly is happening in our school buildings that also can contain more than one school in a building. Um, and so it becomes very complex and very layered. And for New York City, it couldn't be a one size fits all. Um, so we wanted to uh, have a way for parents, for media, for politicians um, to access this information readily. Um, there, were, there were things that were missing from what the Department of Education was providing our communities. And so we wanted to fill those gaps. As we were coming into this school year, um, we were also looking at what other districts were doing. Um, so Los Angeles is the second largest school district after New York City. Um, and we were seeing that Los Angeles was doing some really amazing things in terms of protecting those, the people in their school buildings. They provided a remote option, New York didn't. They created a baseline test. So students and teachers had to be tested before coming in um, in order to know where they were. They provided 100% testing, independent of vaccination for every person in a school building. Um, they had triggers, a threshold for investigations. Um, they had vaccine mandates. Uh, and so all, lots of things that New York was not doing. Um, New York, even though it has um, close to 1 million children in, in school buildings, did not provide a remote option. They are literally testing at the, at the capacity of 10% of, of our students. Um, now weekly, they started monthly. Uh, and so 
there's lots of things um, that they have not supported in order to uh, have these mitigation factors in place to protect our communities. And again, these are communities that have been highly affected by the COVID pandemic. Next slide. And so some of the things that we wanna highlight in terms of what's happening in New York City. Um, so we've had over almost 900 cases after the 28th um, of October. Uh, we have, you know, there are 100 school cases themselves reported on that particular day. So there are some moments um, that we're seeing these spikes, we're seeing increases independent of a vaccine mandate for teachers um, and for the adults in those buildings. There are 16 New York City public schools that have, have had 20 cases or more that has not triggered a shutdown um, in any way. Uh, we have only one, had one school that has closed down and it was actually in my neighborhood. Um, and it was something that was like not even spoken of, right? You had a ton of articles the first two days that school started and then we're no longer having these conversations. 86% of our schools have had at least one case. And so these are things that we continue to track and that we continue to look at. Um, and we've been able to do that because of our people's dashboard. And Liz is gonna talk to you about our people's dashboard and then we'll come back and wrap it up. Sorry about that. I uh, will go back to screen sharing. Sorry, one moment. And Liz, can you move yourself over to the left so we can see you enlarged a little bit, please? Sure. Hold on. I don't know. I'm about to hold on. Okay. Sorry. There I am. Okay. And I will share my screen. Okay. Presenting. Here we go. Can you hear me? I have a feeling you can't hear me, but maybe you can. I can't we hear, see. We hear you. You're oh, awesome. beautiful. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, all I see is my presentation. Um, so though our mayor says our policies are the quote unquote gold standard, uh, clearly they are not. Uh, last year, 600,000 plus families opted out of in-person school because we assessed the risks ourselves and they were too high. Additionally, some families wanted to stay out to provide space for distancing for anyone who felt they really needed to have their child attend in person or because of their work situations. Um, in essence, we kept us safe. In the same vein, Press NYC decided to create a people's dashboard. It doesn't provide all of the essential data because some of what of that is not available anywhere but it does give everyone more access um, access only data scraping of doe web pages can provide our dashboard would not be possible without parent volunteers who have coding coding expertise and have volunteered their time so um so this is this comes directly from um the doe's web page we are offered this covid case map as you can see if you click on it, um, you quickly go <laughs> to a mess of dots that are, it's extremely difficult to navigate. There's absolutely no way to get a sense of the overall. Um, it's the kind of map that usually has some sort of um, option to download it as a table, but in this case, it does not. Um, so that's so just giving you a sense of what we face. Um, this chart comes from uh, our dashboard. Um, so though this incidence, though the in incidence info you see here is available in the city's GitHub, which is kind of the, the in case you don't know, it's a place where they put um, all the files that, that are um, kind of available to the public kind of open data files. Um, so though these, uh, 
what's on this chart is available in the GitHub. It's not offered as a chart anywhere. So we're um, the only place that, that kind of shows this comparison week to week. And we put it at the top of our dashboard because incidence rates are a key determinant of how safe any particular group is in our city right now. Um, as, <laughs> and as you can see, before school started on September 13th, the community rate, uh, the green, and the, um, the orange and the magenta were all in the same place. Um, and then as soon as school started, the 5 to 11-year-olds and the, I think it's 5 to 12s and the 13 to 17s um, rose quickly, um, steadily, and we continue to be, the 5 to 11s continue to be 60-something percent higher than the community rate. So, um, so these trends are similar to what's happening across the country. In our case, if we had data responsive policies, this would trigger some sort of action. For instance, pivoting to an opt-out rather than an opt-in testing consent policy or um, drastically increasing testing. So this is another piece of data that the DOE offers the public. Um, as you can see, it's uh, today's, not today's, but October 31st numbers, um, and then cumulative numbers. So. Uh, if you want to know what happened the day before on October 30th, you don't, you can't see that here. The only way you'd be able to see that is if you took a screenshot, um, which is exactly what we did for many, many months until we realized that we could try to find some volunteers to help us create our own dashboard. So this is another chart from uh, the people's dashboard. And um, let's see, this is the week to week trends. We can say um, for sure, we can't say for sure what caused the dip here, but um, it did happen after the uh, mayor changed. And the reason I say the mayor changed uh, is because we have mayoral control in New York City. So um, whatever happens in terms of our schools uh, really comes from um, City Hall. And uh, the mayor saw that there were a lot of um, students in quarantine and, and his response to that data was to change the quarantine policy, even though um, that was kind of at the height of the case rates here. Um, and then what then happened is that parents no longer got an email that suggested that they get their child tested. And it's possible that that is one of the reasons why we have fewer um, cases right now. Okay, so this is a chart, um, okay, Sorry. We also chart uh, the cases daily as they come uh, as they come in, and we have this chart that shows the total student cases in red and the cases that come in via school testing in purple. We are hopeful that this chart has made it harder for the mayor to only point to in school testing the purple, and we also use this chart to encourage families to get tested weekly in our "We Keep Us Safe" messaging. So. This is just a quick little tour I'm going to do. So you've already seen these charts. And um, we also have, in addition to the charts, and I don't know how well you guys can see this, but we have searchable tables. Um, and one of them is called um, classroom closures and other school investigations with experimental advanced query tools. <laughs> and this is my favorite part of the dashboard. Uh, so I'm clicking on it. And then you can see here that it gives me, it breaks the data up. So there's 502 interventions. That's either classroom closure, partial closure, or non-classroom closure that are happening in schools. This is a couple days ago, I think. And then it divides it up by the, the school, <coughs> sorry, the site name, and then the district code. We have 32 districts in New York City um, public schools. And so I can see right away that District 31 has 74 closures of some kind, and then District 2 has 36, which is actually quite interesting because they have almost the same population of students. Um, so there's, so right away I can see all kinds of things here. 
uh, we can look at, try to figure out how many days of quarantine um, are generally happening. You can see between the boroughs. Um, and then in this case, it's gonna take you to Polaris's district, um, District 4. She's the president of the Education Council, which is like the school board, except for with a lot less power because we have mayoral control. So if she clicks on District 4, she can see all the closures that are happening in her district. And then she can click on that option and export the file. So those are just some of the things that we have available on our dashboard. And I'm going to kick it back to Clearis. So as you can see, we have really important ways that you can access this information because it's readily downloadable and families have the opportunity to see not just total cases, um, but also which schools and the districts. And it's been really useful for us in terms of holding our superintendents accountable and holding the Department of Education accountable um, and also being able to track the cases. Next slide. We've engaged elected officials. Again, sometimes it's really difficult to like really extract the data from the Department of Education and you don't have the ability to track exactly what's happening in school communities because we have loosened mitigation factors in terms of how many schools actually have classroom closures or whether they're partial classroom closures, um, whether it was a classroom or some other um, school environment that needed to be closed or quarantined and making those differences between students and staff, we have the ability now to provide them with the data. And so then they can also ask for, you know, in terms of the denominator, like what does that look like? We didn't get accurate numbers in terms of how many students were actually in our public school buildings until last week. <laughs> so um, the elected officials were able to ask for that to ask for the breakdown of vaccinated students, right? The Department of Health was providing us with the information of percentage of students and by demographics, but they were not telling us how many of these were public school students versus charter school students versus private school students. Like, we don't know. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know how many kids are protected. We do know um, that there are disparities in those numbers. Um, and we do see differences between families of color particularly Black and Latino students, um, and what's happening with our white and Asian populations. Why is that? Um, that did not trigger more testing in those communities either, um, which is really disturbing um, when we look at this data. And so um, what we're really advocating is that we, can, we use this data efficiently and effectively um, that, that is transparent, that parents can have access to it, that teachers can have access to it. But we hope that what ends up happening in these conversations that, is that we can push for uh, more data-driven uh, mitigation strategies. Uh, you know, what sorts of, in, how do we compare the incidence races, what's happening within incidence rates, what's happening among different demographics, um, what sorts of things can we do in order to continue to provide effective safety in our schools, like tracking CO2 levels, like tracking the vaccination rates in our schools, like providing vaccination in schools. Um, in terms of testing, consent is needed in order to test in our schools. Um, and some schools, uh, they don't have a high percentage of opt-in for testing. So if you want to come back to school, then we need some sort of negative test. We don't have that. Um, and so with the dashboard, we have the ability to track what's happening in neighborhoods. Um, again, local school boards, elected officials, and the media are able to see the whole story of what's happening in our schools. Yeah. And so um, we just want to elevate uh, a quote from um, Jessica Galargo in the New York Times. Um, My research suggests that it's because public health messaging during much of the pandemic reassured parents that children, especially healthy children, were at low risk of contract, con contracting, transmitting, and suffering serious consequences from COVID-19. 
those public health and media messages use usage mothers work lessen usage to mothers worries leading them to view COVID-19 vaccines as unnecessary, even if they previously accepted all the other recommended vaccines for children. On the one hand, scaring parents unnecessarily is unproductive. On the other hand, absence of fear around children and COVID-19 is discouraging parents from having their children do their part in the greater good. Um, and we really, again, want to make sure that with our dashboard, people feel validated in their fears and their concerns. Um, we don't, you know, we, we've been going to all these forums where our mayor is like, we have the gold standard of mitigation factors. Um, and we're like, yeah, no, bro, that's not really how this is working out for you. Um, we've had the opportunity, again, we have to be credible sources. So to engage with the media so that we can push for, again, these evidence-driven mitigations um, in order to support our communities. And we've been able to monitor things, become watchdogs, and also um, represent a model of how we should engage in addressing the needs of our communities with a diverse group of think tank people <laughs> um, to put this work together uh, so that we can um, facilitate the decision-making process of our families. And so it extends not just from creating these platforms, but we also create slide decks show up at PTA meetings, show up at you at um, union meetings to talk to, to teachers, um, and also create campaigns to support vaccine uptake for our communities because we have this information and we're able to provide it for parents. So, you know, hit us up if you um, want to engage in more conversation or if you have any ideas on how we can improve our work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salas, and thank you, Liz and Shafali. This has been so useful and informative. Um, I, I'm going to start with a couple of questions, um, and I don't know, if Shafali, if you had a couple of other points you wanted to raise. Um, and uh, folks, if you have any questions and would like to type them in the chat, we'll see how many we can get to as well. Um, I, I'm really interested in what each of you spoke about, and one of the things that ties it together to me is um, looking at what is the data that folks would like to see and then how, how do we get there? And um, I know as, as each of you has said, there, there are obstacles and challenges to getting out the information that folks want to see. And also I, I think there's some important questions about for those of us who are not public health experts, what are the questions we should be asking? What, what is the information that we don't see on the typical school district or state dashboard that we should be looking at to put some of our questions in context and really understand data in a more meaningful way. Um, uh, and, and one of the things I've been wondering about is, I know a lot of folks are looking at um, school district data and data that shows um, trends of cases or, or weekly cases in schools. And um, you know, schools, schools are also workplaces. So we've got um, so many entities in this country, we've got states and cities and other jurisdictions that each um, look at their information differently and collect it differently. And you know, in the move toward, I know a lot of folks attending this summit are interested in uh, how do we take action? How do we translate this information into meaningful action? And what is the information we should be asking for? Um, and you know, for, for folks who are not um, in public health, what would we want to see? Would you know, is seeing breakout cases, break, you know, breakthrough cases enough, or is it important to see um, the number of tests every week in a location? And, uh, you know, what should we be asking for? But, but part of what I want to ask you is for each of you um, in the work you're doing, collecting information, um, how, and I'll start with you, Shafali, how does your state um, and localities, how do you, uh, how do workplaces and um, uh, schools handle the kind of data that you collect in contact tracing? And in, in other words, are, are schools considered workplaces or are schools separately gathering information? And how does that affect what we see? I think, uh, I think where I am, it's been a mix. It's they are somewhat on their own. There's a lot of contact tracing done within schools. The data is fed up to the kind of state system and in terms of the towns that choose um, the program I was working with as a kind of pop-off valve, there's been um, support that's been tried to be given to schools, 
But, you know, like one of the questions that I think they and others are grappling with is, is this question of like, there's schools, there's their workplaces, what does it mean to have cases in schools? And you'll hear these like different opinions on, um, is the transmission happening in school? Or is it happening with the kind of outside activities that people may be doing together? And I think, I think the kind of two responses I would give to that are, it depends on who you ask about how important that kind of disaggregation of the understanding of the data is. Um, and workplace comes up in a big way there because then you're talking about staff who, uh, where it's treated kind of as differently as an outbreak. But to answer some of those questions, we don't have the systems in place necessarily, especially because I think in a lot of states, the schools, as you guys were describing also, the schools are separate from the, you know, so, like in a lot of states, nursing homes and schools and these are all like separate uh, entities compared to the general population. And so I think this again speaks to those like data system integrations where I think it's a pretty mixed bag about who's collecting the data for schools. And that also makes the data harder to, to kind of access um, and to bring together. That wasn't a, a great answer to your question, but um, I think for schools, it's pretty mixed there. Thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Salas and Liz, would, would you like to comment? And if you would, I'm sorry, Shepali, I meant to say this, drag yourself into the, uh, to the left so we can see you. Hilarious, do, do you want, should I go for it? Okay. Um, so a couple of things, one one question that you, you asked Laura was what other data would we want or um, kind of, I guess going back to the infrastructure sort of topic, which um, would be, you know, if we, if CO2 levels were monitored in New York City public schools, uh, classrooms, that would long term be a huge deal. And if that were somehow available somewhere. And then the other thing I would just say is, um, and I meant to mention it while I was talking earlier, which is that there is this double data standard uh, going on because we have this great GitHub where we can see all kinds of um, case rates and just so much, you know, raw data that people could process and um, look at over trends and all kinds of things. And for the schools, we have zero access. We can't, you know, unless thankfully, because we have people who are knowledgeable about how to scrape things and, and there's um, a history to what gets uploaded on our GitHub now. And so there's all kinds of ways that people can, can do the things that they should have been able to do before. And it's very confusing as to why um, one entity, which I guess is the Department of Health and Mental Health, um, sort of has this open source or open data situation and the schools have like, like a little black box that, um, and um, so that's that. For me, it's definitely like, I would love to see more demographics data and how that breaks down. Um, I would love to have access to not just, you know, to scrape the data from the CDC as well as um, the American Association of Pediatrics. Um, so that we could also look like a lot of people were like, oh, there are cases in schools, but there are no kids getting hospitalized. No kid is dying. Um, I would hear that at local school board meetings where they were trying to pass resolutions for a remote option. And they're like, ah, no kid has died. Let them all go back to school buildings. Um, but, you know, these are folks that don't understand that this virus can have a significant impact on a child independent of whether they were hospitalized and or passed from it. Um, and so, you know, we did such a good job at minimizing the impacts that children um, could experience from COVID that it just, it was like Delta didn't happen for some people. Um, and so having that accessible to parents, um, a lot of times when I would send the GitHub around um, to parents, they were like, whoa, I didn't realize that we had these many cases or I didn't, you know, and when we, and when we looked at the raw data for hospitalizations, the same thing. I'm like, y'all see these numbers. Um, in addition, for for me, it's been really helpful 
to work with Professor Jen Jennings from Princeton, who has also been looking specifically at the amount of testing that's being done in the different districts in the city. As Liz mentioned, we have 32 districts and we're seeing some really significant disparities about who's getting the actual consistent weekly testing um, versus some districts that have not. And you can you know, make assumptions as to who is not um, getting access. Of course, it's our communities that are predominantly Black, Latinx, and poor communities. Um, and so I got beef with that. Like, what's why? Is it because you're trying to, you know, if you're testing in white affluent communities where we have hospitals and healthcare and access, like, are you trying to hide what's really happening um, so you can continue to, to build on this narrative that schools are safe? Um, and so... Um, for me, that would be incredibly important, particularly to address the disparities that we are seeing um, in our communities. Great, thank you. And um, yeah, and I, I think that, um, you know, this is obviously the beginning of a longer uh, ongoing discussion about what is the information we hope to see and what, and as I know, Shafali, you have said, and a lot of folks I've talked to or work with data have said, you know, the, and I know this is what you're doing at Press NYC, um, Liz and Dr. Salas, is we really need to think about building data systems that will uh, serve our communities um, for the future and, and you know, for public health and wellness and um, uh, socioeconomic information, for, of ways of sharing information that will be useful to our communities um, during, throughout, and beyond this, this particular pandemic. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in how, um, how we might think about what, 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 are, what, what should, what should we be asking for? And, um, Shafali, I'll just ask you as well, um, you know, as, as an epidemiologist, for those of us who, who don't have the understanding of things like doubling rates, which I've heard you discuss in the past and deduplicating data, which is a new term I learned from you, um, what, what is it we should be asking for? Given, given the information that school districts may already have and that states may already be collecting through contact tracing, what, what kinds of things could we begin with asking for if we were going to look for some local or state or national standards for the kind of information we'd like to see? Yeah, um, I think that, I think it's changed a lot with the kind of pandemic. And I think one of the first things I would say is that when data is shared, an explanation of how to interpret it and what it means. So that's not like which data should be shared, but I think that's been missing a lot and it leads to a lot of kind of misinterpretation of what these data actually are. Um, I'll give you an example and, and how to think about data. I'll give you an example of how people have been using positivity rates a lot and I think you and I were talking about this, that's one where if testing goes down as it has many times because of a capacity or other issues, your positivity rate means very different things and can become meaningless. And so I know that's a metric that's been thrown around a lot as like, well, like entire policies have been based on positivity rate, but that one is so dependent on the other things happening in your community, like how, who is getting tested, all that. So I think, um, it's a longer answer and I'm happy to like share a list of metrics that I think are pretty good. I know Resolve to Save Lives initially had had put out a set of metrics. Um, I think what these guys have talked about for schools is a pretty good set of, you know, what are the cases? How many cases are there? Where are they happening? When are they happening? So not aggregated, but really so that you can see what the changes are. And then I think being able to link data to the interventions. So understanding this isn't just a data thing, but sometimes you'll see news reports that say, you know, no school transmission because of X and whether there are all sorts of things there, but understanding what the mask mandates are in place. So when you talk about data, understanding what all the other things that could influence it in a simple enough way um, to say that like a New York City school or a Massachusetts school may be very different from an Arizona school and to not to understand that for school transmission, you need to know the numbers, you need to know what their testing policy is. So someone was saying some northern states have really high cases of um, COVID compared to some southern states that don't have 
um, or as certain states that don't have mask mandates put in and aren't doing, you know, kind of all the interventions. And some of that is related to how there's surveillance testing in a lot of northern schools, right? So those people are getting caught. And so I think that goes back to that, like, what is the data you're looking at and how do you interpret it when even that simple number of how many cases are there? Like that also goes to, are you testing? What are you testing? Who are you testing? Is it surveillance? Are you really, do you think you're picking up the random cases? If it's through contact tracing, how many people are you reaching through your contact tracing program? So I think aside from the core metrics, um, such a long answer, but I'm happy to, if people want, I'm happy to send a list of like my thoughts on metrics, but um, I think interpreting them is, is really important. Wonderful. Thank you. And yeah, and I know um, we'll probably wrap up after this, this we hear from Dr. Salas and Liz. Um, this is so helpful. I, I, I could pick all of your brains all day. Um, but um, similarly, um, you all, uh, Dr. Salas and Liz spoke about Los Angeles. And um, just for folks listening, Los Angeles has really set an amazing standard for the rest of the country that I think a lot of uh, school systems and parents and students are looking to as a model for what we could be doing um, with over half a million students and employees, the school district of the unified, um, the Los Angeles Unified School District uh, this summer stood up um, a program to test every one of their students and uh, staff every week. Um, and uh, so they tested before school started, started with zero cases. They found about 3,200 cases and screened them out and then have been testing every week since and posting the data. Um, and some parents there have even taken it further and taken that data and aggregated it to give even a more granular understanding of where cases are. Um, and uh, I'm really interested in what you, Dr. Salas and Liz, think about um, the kinds of uh, data points and the kinds of, you know, as Shafali is saying, setting the context for understanding um, what you're seeing. What, what would you like to see that, you know, would improve uh, the understanding of people in the districts in New York City. So I and and we're being called to wrap up. Um, so I just want to say that you know we do see again this model. There's absolutely. Um, no way that we have been able in New York to get a full picture of what's happening. And so one of the things that we do try to do on the dashboard is particularly in the graphs, like we have like a, a sentence or two in terms of the interpretation or, or how that data can be used. In addition, in terms of data interpretation, we visit school communities and, and, and school boards um, to help support with kind of understanding what's being put out there. Uh, and so we, we have to support our um, communities with data literacy, right? And so that's, I think that's where, when you have a robust team that kind of thinks about community awareness, language justice, um, but also has some scientists on board, we're able to communicate that in a more effective way. Um, but what we mostly want is of course our city to do right by our kids. Thank you, and um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I'm sorry that we're, we're bleeding a little into the next time of the next folks. We had a few technical challenges at the beginning that had us um, getting folks in here to start a little late. But um, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. We will stay back in touch. Um, I posted my email in the chat. Uh, this, this session was recorded, so you can, uh, down the road, share it with other folks. And um, just thank you all for joining us. Thanks to the World Health Network for hosting and we appreciate all of the speakers' expertise and all of you for attending. Thanks again.